This is an auto-narrated audiobook by computer-generated AI voices. Wolf's Captive Book 1 in the Brides for Beasts, Wolf series by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. Copyright 2023 by Lovestruck Romance, all rights reserved. Prologue One week ago, just calling with a progress report on that juicy tip I told you about. I pace back and forth in my cabin, my cell phone pressed to my ear. My editor groans on the other end of the line. The small town with the freaky secret? Please tell me you've got something good. I can't afford another one of your wild goose chases. I laugh, a little too sharply maybe, but I can't help it. Trust me, Jerry. This isn't a goose chase. Let's just say things are shifting. I can practically see his eyebrow twitch at my cryptic hint. Shifting how, Marla? Shapeshifters, Jerry. And I'm another step closer to cracking the case wide open. A long pause. I picture Jerry scratching his head. You mean like werewolves? I grin, even though he can't see it. No bears to be exact. We're talking a whole community of them. Can you imagine the headline? Where Bear Town Exposed. It's gonna be epic. I hear him shuffling papers on his desk, probably trying to wrap his head around the enormity of the discovery. Marla, are you sure you've got solid evidence? Not yet. I examine my manicure. But I'm deep in the community, and they're clueless about my true intentions. There are several minutes of hesitation. I know he won't back down. He's an old-school newspaper man. A hint of a big scoop and he's all in no matter how outlandish the premise. Finally, he huffs a breath. I hope you're right about this. But you better grab the smoking gun quickly. This undercover assignment of yours has already dragged on too long. I've been researching for over a year, and I'm so close I can taste it. The mountain town where I'm currently staying is closed to outsiders. I swear, the only way to even find it is to be a native resident, or to be invited. Otherwise, it's as though it's got its own invisibility cloak or something. I'm kidding. But hell who knows, really. I know you signed up for a mail-order bride thing as a cover. Don't go falling for any country bumpkins while you're playing house. Jerry grumbles. Stumbling on the BFB program was a stroke of luck. Some company was recruiting single women from the Los Angeles area to come to this po-dunk town as potential brides for a bunch of lonely losers. Needless to say, I hit the ground running on that and managed to be in the first group of candidates. And voila, here I am. I bark a laugh. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. As if I'd ever settled down in this one-horse town. No. I have my sights set on fame and fortune, not a sham marriage. All right, Marla. Jerry concedes. Just don't screw this up. When have I ever, Jerry? I ignore his muttered. More times than I can count. Jerry, let's just say things are about to get real hairy around here. I end the call with visions of Pulitzers dancing in my head, then tap my cell phone screen to make my next call. Silver Lake Residential Facility. A cheery voice answers. How may I help you? Caroline? It's Marla Davis. How is she? Oh, hello, dear. She's, um, she's been asking about you. There's a pause. Marla, I hate to bring it up, but the administration's been trying to get a hold of you about last month's bill. The check is in the mail, I blurt, hoping I sound convincing. In fact, you should have it any day now. Crap, crap, crap. I really need to get this scoop ASAP. Long-term psychiatric hospitals are incredibly costly. All right. I'll let them know. Hang on a moment. I hear some shuffling and muffled voices in the background and then... Baby? Is that you? She slurs her words slightly, and I know it's from the antipsychotic cocktail they keep giving her. Moisture fills my eyes and I blink to keep it from spilling over my lids. It's me, Mama. My Marla, I miss you so much. I can't wait to see you again. I clear my throat. Hearing my mother call me my Marla always makes me choke up. I can't wait either, Mama. I'm out of town on an assignment right now, but as soon as I'm back in LA, I'm heading straight to you. And when I get back, things are going to be much better. I promise. I'm going to get you out of there, I don't say it aloud because she probably won't believe me. And why should she? Twenty years is a long time. It's a long time to be told you're crazy and delusional but I'm so close to proving that everything Mama says she saw really does exist. 
I'm not leaving Mystic Hollow without proof. You hang in there a little longer, I say soothingly. I'll see you very soon. You're not delusional, Mama. Not delusional at all. Very soon the entire world will know the truth. And my mother will finally have vindication. One week ago. I shouldn't be here. I know this. I shouldn't have entered Mystic Hollow town limits at all. Our Wolfpack's peace with the neighboring Bear Shifter clan is tenuous at best, and if I'm caught snooping around their territory, it won't bode well for our Pack clan relationship. But they have something of mine, and her scent is irresistible. I scented her several days ago when I was patrolling the border where our territory butts up against theirs, and I can't stay away. I've been covertly hanging around trying to spot her for days, catching small hints of her fragrance here and there, but never actually seeing her. This might be my chance. Something is going on tonight, some big party at the Mystic Hollow Community Center. Human females and bear shifter males are showing up for this shindig dressed to the nines in ball gowns and tuxedos. I'm hidden in the tree line out back like an obsessed stalker, just hoping to catch a glimpse of my mate without being spotted by. Fuck. Too late. Silas Orso, the Clan Alpha, is standing on the outdoor patio with a human woman. I know he sensed me because his head snaps in my direction, and his eyes are now taking on an iridescent glow. Yep, he spots me. Now I have two choices. One, I can tuck tail and run. Or two, I can stay and fight. The first option may be more diplomatic, more practical, and wiser. But I'm a shifter. Not only that, I'm a wolfpack enforcer. Tucking my tail between my legs is not in my DNA. In a split second, Silas's massive grizzly bursts forth shredding his tuxedo which falls off him in tatters as he races toward me, fangs bared. I've got nothing personal against Silas. He's only defending his territory, I respect that. I don't want a deathmatch here or anything, but running away without at least a small tussle is admitting cowardice in our world. I'm no coward so I let my wolf loose. My muscles coil like springs beneath my fur, and his bear roars with a bloodthirsty savage ferocity. The forest around us seems to hold its breath, as if nature itself has paused to witness the clash that's about to unfold. The air is thick with the scent of dominance. Adrenaline pumps through my veins, sharpening my senses and heightening my awareness as a half-ton grizzly launches itself through the air with a murderous war cry. Fuck. He's a big motherfucker. But I'm fast. I dart out of the way narrowly avoiding the swipe of his claws as they tear through the air where I stood a moment ago. I counter with a quick snap, aiming for his flank. We spin, twist and pivot, a frenzy of fur fangs and claws. I go for his throat, but he uses his bulk to roll us over, temporarily pinning me to the ground. I snap my jaws trying to land a bite as I maneuver my way out from under his lardass. He sends me skidding across the grass, but I spring back to my feet and lunge. This time he catches me mid-leap with those six-inch dagger claws of his. Good shot, but I manage to clamp down on his paw and sink my razor-sharp fangs into his flesh. The metallic tang of blood is in the air. He advances again, his growls and snarls melding into a cacophony of rage. I meet his aggression with my own as we engage in a deadly dance of brute force. Finally, after what I consider a respectable brawl, it's time to surrender this fight. Before I really hurt him. Silas doesn't give chase when I dart off into the woods dripping a trail of blood behind me. I may be delayed but I'm not deterred. I'll get my mate, even if I have to corner her, throw her over my shoulder, and carry her off to Timbercrest Village kicking and screaming. Chapter 1 Present Day Dressed head to toe in camo, I duck behind a large oak clutching my cell phone in a death grip, ready to record at a split second's notice. This could be it, the moment I've been waiting for. I watch the ground making sure not to step on anything that might crunch or snap underfoot, as I stealthily trail a huge guy, one of the locals here in Mystic Hollow, through the trees. Once I get photographic evidence of one of these local yokels shape-shifting, I can clear out of this backwater hick town. Stifling an excited giggle, I press myself flat against the tree trunk, then peer around it to watch the man stop and chat with the BFB candidate. Yumi, I think her name is. I nibble my lower lip impatient as they talk. Come on already just shift so I can get this over with. Finally, he continues deeper into the woods. I make sure to stay downwind as I creep along, tiptoeing quietly as a mouse. Don't want to spook the prey before I can snap the money shot. He's about a hundred yards up ahead when he stops and glances around before stripping off his clothes. My pulse quickens. 
This is it. I aim my cell, hands trembling and press record just as fur sprouts along the man's naked body. Holy shit. Holy fucking shit balls. I mean I knew it was real. I thought so anyway. I was counting on it. But believing and actually seeing are two entirely different things. It only takes moments for his body to morph and reshape. When it's over where there once was a man, there now stands a huge grizzly bear. I fight down the scream of triumph that wants to crawl up my throat. Gotcha you freak. This footage is gonna make my career. I'll be on every talk show and news station across the country. Bye-bye, entertainment blogging. Hello, investigative journalism. More importantly, I'll finally be able to do right by mama. I'm practically bursting at the seams. Just as I tap the screen to send the video to cloud storage, I'm grabbed from behind. My shriek is muffled by a massive hand clamped over my mouth. I kick, scream and wail but my attacker's other arm is around my waist and it feels like a steel band. Even struggling with all my might seems in vain. The grizzly bear is long gone by the time the hand over my mouth finally drops and I'm lifted off my feet and tossed over a brutishly large shoulder. Help! Help! I scream, flail my arms and kick my legs frantically but my captor is immovable. It's like I'm beating on a brick wall. As I'm carried deeper into the woods farther from Mystic Hollow, one thing becomes crystal clear, I'm being kidnapped. I slap her ass. Stop wiggling. Smack. Ow. Jesus motherfucking Christ when you put me down, I am going to murder you. As soon as you let go of me, you're a goner buster. Nothing to worry about then. I'm not letting go of you. Ever. I tromp through the woods with my mate draped over my shoulder squirming like an earthworm after a summer rain. Her attempts to bite me with her small blunt teeth and scratch me with her tiny claws were laughable, and she eased up on them after I pretended to almost drop her. Yeah, that's what you think, buddy. I'm gonna start getting mighty heavy pretty soon. You'll have to put me down unless you want to throw your back out. I'm a shifter, I tell her. You're as light as a feather. And then I smack her ass again, just because I love how it jiggles. Smack. Ouch. God fucking damn it. Stop cursing. Smack. You buttface. Smack. Ow. Buttface doesn't count as a curse. It counts. Smack. Grr. Impressive growl. For a human. Put me down you brute. What are you? A caveman? You can't just toss someone over your shoulder and abduct them. Wait. Did you say shifter? Do you turn into a bear too? I scoff loudly. A bear? Hell no. Don't insult me. Do I look like I scare tourists and rummage through picnickers garbage? Then what? She presses. A mountain lion? A billy goat? Funny, I say flatly. I'm a wolf. She inhales sharply. A werewolf? Her voice lilts upward. She's excited. My wolf preens at that. We prefer wolf shifter. Werewolf has too many strange Hollywood connotations, like needing a full moon to shift, but yeah. She squirms again. Where exactly are you taking me? Home. She goes silent for a moment. To your home? Our. Home. This sets off another wiggle fest. Put me down, you Neanderthal. She hisses, twisting her body as if she's wrestling an alligator. Sure. Right after you promise not to run away and expose our entire community. Oh wait, you can't promise that, can you? I saw what she was doing, recording a shift with her phone, which is now in my pocket. You're safe. I promise. Safe? You literally tossed me over your shoulder and kidnapped me. So excuse me if I don't find your promises particularly reassuring. I sigh patiently and resume walking. Neanderthal. She mumbles again. After another half mile or so, I feel her body relax. Two more miles later, she goes limp and her breathing becomes shallow and rhythmic. The fight must have drained out of her. I never thought that would happen. I chuckle. My mate is a feisty one. The moonlight filters through the trees as I near Timbercrest Village, dodging branches and stepping over down limbs and large rocks. I adjust her on my shoulder, trying to make the position more comfortable for her, and I'm struck by an odd sensation. My wolf lets out a satisfied sigh of contentment, and I feel at peace. 
Is it the mate bond taking root, or is it too soon for that? Either way, I know this is the beginning of something magical, something wonderful. It's also going to rain down so much trouble on my head, I'll be lucky if I'm not beaten to within an inch of my life. Chapter 2 What the? When I open my eyes, I'm in a strange bedroom with my arms pinned above my head. Then everything comes flooding back. I was recording a man shifting into a bear. I finally got my proof when I was grabbed from behind by a hot arrogant assholish lumberjack type. Lumberjerk tossed me over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes, then. I must have fallen asleep at some point. I try to move but can't. My wrists are tied to a large iron bed frame with what looks like ripped bed sheets. Oh hell no. I tug at my bindings but they don't budge. Shit I hiss. Speaking of the kidnapping jerk, he's lying next to me sound asleep. In the bed. Where I'm tied up. No wonder lumberjerk tied me up. Can't have me stabbing him in his sleep. I study the man's chiseled features and muscular frame. Even relaxed in sleep he oozes raw primal masculinity. Damn him and his unfair attractiveness. I slam both feet into his side. Wake up you psychotic mountain jackass. He jolts awake, blinking at me through the messy hair falling in waves over his forehead. Slowly he sits up, scrubbing a hand over his face. I hate that he looks so annoyingly edible, even when he's rumpled from sleep. I can't exactly cross my arms over my chest with them tied, so I settle for glaring daggers at him instead. The corner of his mouth hitches up. Morning, mate. Sleep okay? Mate? Is he messing with me right now? Oh yeah, I slept like a baby with my hands tied to the bed you creep. I punctuate my words with another swift kick to his leg this time. He doesn't even flinch. Not a morning person. Got it. The jerk has the audacity to chuckle. Well since we're both awake. He sits up, the sheet slipping dangerously low on his hips. Stop looking, Marla. I jerk my gaze up to meet his eyes which are glowing a golden yellow. How about I make us some breakfast? Make me breakfast? Is he delusional? I narrow my eyes. How about you untie me and then go jump off the nearest cliff? I say with an exaggerated smile and a saccharine voice. A simple no thanks would suffice. He swings his legs over the side of the bed, giving me an unsolicited glimpse of his naked muscular backside as he stands. Oh. Don't look. Do not look at the tight bare ass. I squeeze my eyes shut until I hear him pull on jeans. When I open them again, he's leaning over me, one hand braced on the mattress. He smells like cedar, cloves and musk and my pulse skitters erratically. His gaze roams my body. Enjoying the view. I snap. As a matter of fact, I am. His voice is a deep rumble that makes my insides tingle. I scowl to cover it up. Well stop gawking and untie me. He pretends to consider it. Come on. He strokes his chin stubble. Nope. I don't think I will. My mouth drops open. Is he serious? What do you want from me? His eyes soften. I already told you, sweetheart. You're my mate. I can understand if you're scared but… Scared? You don't know anything about me you dick weasel. He looks thoughtful. Well, we've got plenty of time to get to know each other now. Get to know each other? Listen, I don't know what kind of Stockholm Syndrome fantasy you've cooked up in that pea brain of yours but let's get one thing straight, I'm not and will never be your mate. I wiggle two fingers from each hand but air quotes don't work so well when you're tied up. And stop calling me sweetheart. My name is Marla. He grins. My name is Asa. See there. We're on a first name basis already. You complete jackass. I can't believe you're keeping me tied up like this. Lumberjerk pats my head like I'm a child. You just rest up mate. I'll fix us some food and later I'll give you the full tour of the village. I jerk my head away from his touch. Oh joy. I can't wait. Maybe after that we can roast marshmallows and sing kumbaya. I give him my best death glare. With a resigned sigh he leans over me, his big body hovering above mine as despite my anger, a peculiar need unfurls low in my belly. His nostrils flare, dangerous glint in his glowing eyes. You done? Not. Even. Close. My words emerge with the venom of a thousand cobras. That's what I thought. Without another word, 
he reaches over to the nightstand and pulls out a roll of duct tape. Before I can even scream a protest, he presses a strip over my mouth. There. That's better. He smiles like he's proud of his ingenuity. You just relax and I'll be back with some breakfast in a bit. Bastard. Chapter 3 Damn if my mate isn't a little spitfire. Gotta admit, I like it. Her fiery nature makes the chase more exciting. She's not gonna make this easy on me, but I don't mind a challenge. Rummaging through the fridge, I pull out eggs, bacon, sausage, all the fixings for a good hearty breakfast. Then I add the ingredients for pancakes. I don't know what she likes to eat for breakfast, so I decide to add waffles too. As I cook, I smile at how lucky I am to have found her against all odds. Timbercrest Village has had a vein of bad luck for nearly 40 years now. Females just stop being born. The Shifter Council has done various things to investigate, but they haven't got a clue either. Some kind of magic blocking our she-wolves is my guess. A spell of some sort maybe. It's been rough for us younger males. Most of us sneak off into human towns once a month to find release. Okay yes to fuck. As long as we're discreet, don't form relationships, and keep our mouths shut, the council turns a blind eye to our one and dones with humans. They see it as a necessary evil. But the council placed a strict ban on human females in Timbercrest Village, too risky letting outsiders in. I release a sigh. That'll be a problem since my mate is fully human, but I'll tackle that challenge when it arises. I crack another egg into the skillet, watching it sizzle and pop. The kitchen is filled with the smell of bacon, eggs, and fresh biscuits baking. I peek in the oven to check on the biscuits before focusing again on the eggs. Let's see, scrambled or over easy, I muse aloud. I'm not used to having company for breakfast. Or any other meal for that matter. My cabin's been a lone wolf dwelling for as long as I can remember. But now there's a woman sleeping in my bed. My woman. My mate. Marla. Just thinking those words makes my wolf howl with possessive pride. I've got a mate. A real living breathing mate made just for me. And I'll be damned if I won't bend over backward to be the best damn male for her. I have occasionally sampled the goods outside our borders, but it never felt quite right or all that fulfilling. I want what most of us male shifters want through companionship. A bond you can't get from a random hookup. All of us are jealous of the older packmates who have that connection. But now everything's changed. Marla. Even her name sends a spike of heat through me. And having her sent here at my den, it's the best damn thing I've ever smelled. I don't know why she was in Bear Clan territory, but shit's gonna hit the fan about me taking her. I need a little time to figure out how I'm going to handle the situation with Deke, my Alpha, and the Council. Which is why she's currently bound to my bed. I'm not keeping her tied up because I want to. It's for her own good, until I can make everyone understand that she's mine. That I had no choice. We don't pick our mates, fate chooses for us. I scrape the sausages and bacon onto a plate, and add eggs both scrambled and over easy, then decide to whip up an omelette packed with cheese, tomatoes and onions. Bread's toasting, biscuits are done, juice is poured. I arrange it all on a tray, and then add the fluffy waffles and pancakes slattered in butter and dripping with maple syrup. My mate is the answer to a long and heartfelt prayer, and I intend to spoil her rotten. I'm so grateful for her very existence. Balancing the plates in my hands, I make my way to the bedroom wondering if this is what it's gonna be like from now on, waking up next to my mate and cooking breakfast for her every morning. I hope so because I could get used to this real fast. Marla snoring softly, her wrist still bound to the bed frame so I set the plates on the nightstand and lean down to nuzzle her neck. She smells divine like honeysuckle and warm female. As I gently remove the tape from her mouth, I let out a rumbling growl and nip at her skin. Marla's eyes fly open and she yelps, tugging at the ties around her wrists. Breakfast is ready, I say with a grin. Her eyes narrow to slits. Let me go you unhinged wolf freak. I chuckle at her dramatics and sit on the edge of the bed. Come on now, that's no way to talk to your mate. I made you a nice breakfast. When I lift a plate to hold it near her mouth, she turns her head away. I'm not hungry. My nostrils flare. Liar. I can hear her stomach grumbling. I grab her chin and turn her face toward me. She glares but doesn't resist when I bring a forkful of omelette to her lips. From the first taste, her pupils dilate and she leans forward to take more. I can't keep the satisfied rumble from vibrating through my chest as I hand feed her. 
A primal possessive part of me revels in taking care of my woman like this. She's mine to shelter, mine to provide for, mine too. I have to pee. My eyes narrow. I'm not sure I trust her. Fine. She shrugs. I'll just pee the bed. You wouldn't. She lifts a challenging brow. Damn. She would. I start working on the knots binding her wrists. No funny business, I warn her. You try anything, and I'll just have to tie you right back up again. Gee? My sassy mate deadpans. Don't threaten me with a good time. Chapter 4 While my mate is occupied, I gather up the dirty breakfast dishes, take them to the kitchen, dump them in the sink, then busy myself tidying up. A few minutes after the toilet flushes, my mate appears in the doorway with her hands on her hips. All right, joke's over. She announces. You've had your fun, now take me back to Mystic Hollow. You're not going anywhere, I state plainly. You're mine now. Her mouth drops open. Listen here Cujo, I belong to no man. I'm not property. In wolf shifter culture mates belong to each other. I take a step toward her but she dances back out of reach. Faded mates are sacred, ordained by the moon goddess herself. Well I'm not a wolf, am I? Marla crosses her arms defiantly. No. I grin, flashing my sharp canines. You're the mate of a wolf. There's so much I want to tell her, to explain to her, but before I can, my landline rings. I'd ignore it but the number that pops up on caller ID is Deeks. My alpha. Shit. I pick up the receiver. Alpha. Asa, my office. Now. I wince at Deke's gruff voice. Being summoned to his office is never a good thing. On my way, I reply briskly before hanging up. He can't already know I have a human female in my cabin, can he? Get back in the bedroom, I order Marla, my brow furrowing nervously. She scowls at me. I open my hands in a placating gesture. It's for your own safety. I'll let you out as soon as I get back. I promise. She huffs but surprisingly she spins on her heel and marches back down the hall. Shaking my head, I slide the bolt of the lock I installed on the outside of the bedroom door before leaving my cabin. I'm not looking forward to this. Deke's going to lose his damn mind. It's early and when I step outside, the sun is barely peeking over the mountains surrounding our village. Most of the pack is still asleep, but a few early risers shuffle blearily towards the mess hall for breakfast. I nod in greeting but don't stop to chat. Deke sounded impatient on the phone. I know better than to keep him waiting. I wrap my knuckles against the solid pine door leading to my alpha's office. Deke's reply is a brusque. Enter. Squaring my shoulders, I turn the knob and step inside. Alpha sits behind his massive desk glowering. His salt and pepper beard does nothing to soften the sternness of his expression. Something tells me this isn't gonna be a friendly morning chat over coffee and donuts. I just got off the phone with my father. Deke begins without preamble. Ah shit. That explains the mood. Talking to the councilman first thing in the morning is enough to ruin anyone's day. Seems there's been some trouble over in Mystic Hollow. They're claiming one of our wolves has been hanging around their territory and has allegedly abducted. Deke stops mid-sentence. His nostrils flare like a bloodhound at a barbecue as he scents the air. I wince. Yeah, Marla's scent is all over me. I carried her a good ten miles last night. No hiding that from Alpha's sensitive nose. Asa. Deke says calmly. Too calmly. Why do I smell a human female on you? Welp. No use lying. I didn't steal her, I blurt. She's mine. I mean, how can you steal something that belongs to you? Are you out of your fucking mind? Deke's eyes nearly bug out of his head. Please tell me you're kidding. I just shrug, not knowing how else to respond. Poaching a clan female. You trying to start a war, Asa? His face contorts in rage and turns the color of a vine-ripened tomato. Do you know how much shit is gonna come down on us from the Shifter Council? Kidnapped. You fucking kidnapped a human. A female no less. Why does he keep repeating himself? I already know what I did. Damn it, Asa, what the fuck were you thinking? I don't answer. Mainly because I don't have any more of an answer than I've already given. She's mine. That should be enough. You have caused a massive shitstorm. Those bears are ready to declare war over this. 
I've never been so disappointed in you. I bristle at his condescending tone. I feel like a naughty pup who chewed his favorite slippers, but it also guts me to hear him say he's disappointed in me. Deke raised me after my parents died. He's like a father to me. But Marla is my number one, simple as that. Deke's never had a mate, so he can't possibly understand the strong pull between faded mates. We don't force breed females, Asa. He shakes his head. A menacing growl comes from low in my chest. Force breed her. I would never. She'll want to take my cock. She'll beg me for it. Deke runs a hand down his face. Look, you might be the biggest motherfucker in our pack, but I'm still the meanest and I'm still your alpha. You're going to take her back where you found her. Apologize for the misunderstanding. Then you will endure whatever punishment and make whatever reparations the council deems necessary. Punishment doesn't scare me, but take her back. No fucking way. Not gonna happen. Just the thought causes my canines to descend and fur to sprout along my arms. No one will force my mate and me to part. As an alpha wolf myself, I'll put up one hell of a fight to keep her. Surely Deke knows that. Next thing I know I'm fully in my wolf form, growling and baring my teeth, braced in a crouched fighting stance. My wolf and I both will battle to the death to defend our mating. Deke throws his head back and screams at the ceiling. Fuck. Why can't anything around here go smoothly? Chapter 5 As soon as he leaves the room, I spring into action rifling through the closet, dresser and nightstand drawer for anything I can use as either a weapon or a tool to help me escape. No luck. Clothes shoes, a paperback western novel, a handful of coins and a roll of duct tape. Hurrying over to the window, I push it open and peer out. My heart sinks. The cabin is built on the edge of a steep, jagged incline, leaving no possibility of climbing out this way. I slump down on the bed and let my head fall back on the pillow. Damn it. I'm truly trapped. For now, because I will get out of here. Once I escape this backwoods nightmare, I'll contact Jerry and send him my video proof. Who knows, maybe I can even capitalize on this experience. I'll do an expose, write a tell-all book. Shifters among us. One woman's brave escape from a paranormal backwoods freakish cult. Ha. Huh. That'll be a bestseller for sure. Oprah will probably want it for her book club. This morning I planned on refusing to eat, going on a hunger strike, but my traitorous stomach couldn't manage it, not when Asa brought in a spread worthy of being an IHOP Sunday brunch buffet and it was all so freaking good. An idea strikes me. I have no hope of overpowering my captor physically. But if I can make him lower his guard around me, Convince him I'm warming up to the idea of being his mate. Maybe I can get him to release me. Then I'll make a break for it. It's a long shot, but I don't have any better options. If it means stroking Wolfman's ego, so be it. I'm not averse to swallowing my pride. The sound of the front door followed by heavy footsteps thudding down the hall makes me sit up straight in bed. My pulse kicks up a notch. Showtime. The door swings open and Asa appears in the doorway eyebrows lifting when he sees me perched expectantly on the edge of the mattress. Been behaving yourself while I was gone? His voice is all relaxed and casual like we're some Instagram couple. I force my lips into a coy smile. Oh yes. I've just been lying here thinking about you. His eyes narrow suspiciously. Is that so? He leans a shoulder against the doorframe, arms crossed over his massive chest as his eyes skim over me. I roll over on my tummy bend my knees and kick my feet back and forth playfully while giving him what I hope is an alluring look through my lashes. Yep. I've decided being your prisoner isn't so bad. I pat the space beside me. Why don't you come over here and we can? I wink to get my point across. Talk. His eyes gleam with interest, but he doesn't move from the doorway. As tempting as that offer is, darling, I know you're up to something. One corner of his mouth quirks. What's your game here? Damn wolf smarter than he looks. But I'm not giving up yet. I bite my lip and glance away all shy-like. I just thought, since we're in this cozy cabin together, we might as well make the best of it. When I peek up at him again, I hold his gaze. I can make it good for you, Asa. Oh, I bet you can. His lips twitch again. What do you say? I purr. Wanna play? Then I roll onto my back bite my lips seductively and trail my hand down my stomach very slowly. Ace's nostrils flare, his eyes tracking the movement. Gotcha. I see the exact moment his restraint snaps. 
He's on me in seconds pinning me, his big body pressing mine into the mattress. Think you can toy with me, little mate? His voice is pure gravel. Think again. Toy with you? I put on a pouty duck face while I stare up at him. I just thought maybe you'd like to join me in the shower, and we can get to know each other proper. Before I can finish my sentence, his mouth crashes down on mine in a blistering kiss that steals my breath. Holy hell. My toes literally curl into the sheets. This backwoods mountain man knows what he's doing with those lips. Get it together, Marla. This is just part of the plan. Still, I can't stop my fingers from spearing into his caramel waves as our mouths move together. The man's built like a brick wall but his hair is sinfully soft and thick. When he finally breaks for air, we're both panting. His eyes simmer with lust, all hints of distrust replaced by sheer desire. This is my in, and I'm taking it. Before I can formulate my next move, his head dips to press a trail of hot open mouth kisses along my neck. All my senses come alive and my body lights up wherever his sexy lips touch. Don't fall under his spell, I remind myself. Focus on the end game here, freedom. As he reaches that sensitive spot beneath my ear, I gasp and press my thigh between his legs, feeling his arousal. For one breathless moment he just looks down at me, eyes blazing. Then a slow wicked smile spreads across his face. Asa rolls off the bed, scoops me up effortlessly and carries me bridal style into the adjoining bathroom. As he does I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror, mascara smudged and hair a wild tangled mess. I resemble a deranged raccoon. How is this seduction thing even working? I don't know but it is. Asa's eyes are molten, his erection is hard as steel, and my panties are soaked. Stay cool Marla. Freedom is just one shower sex away. Chapter 6 Asa sets me gently on my feet. The space is small, just a shower, sink, and toilet, but like the rest of the cabin the bathroom is beautifully decorated with top-of-the-line products. When he reaches around me to crank on the shower spray, the movement presses his sculpted chest flush to my back. Um. Damn the man is built. Well? He plants a kiss below my ear. Ladies first. Such a gentleman. I toss him a saucy look over my shoulder. Aren't you going to undress me? His grin flashes white against his tan skin. It would be my pleasure. He keeps our bodies pressed close as his fingers slide down my side to grip the hem of my camo t-shirt. Maintaining eye contact he slowly peels it up and off. The cool air on my exposed skin makes me shiver. Fuck. You're gorgeous. His heated gaze roams over me. Since I'm a member of the Tiny Titty Committee, I'm not wearing a bra, so there are just camo pants between me and full frontal. The warmth that floods my cheeks has nothing to do with the rising steam. I don't know what's wrong with me. This isn't my first shirtless rodeo. Why am I so affected by this man? I reach for the button of his jeans to redirect some of his sizzling attention off of me. I want to see you too. He makes a low growly sound as I unbutton and push the rough denim down revealing his black boxer briefs concealing. Yowza. It looks like he's packing an anaconda in there. Once I get his pants off, Asa kicks them aside. Then hooks his thumbs in my belt loops, tugging me against him. I do believe it's still my move, sweetheart. His voice is pure smoke and sex as he pops the button on my pants. And I want these off. He peels my pants and panties down my legs slowly, his fingers leaving trails of heat in their wake. Then he crouches, helps me to step out of them, and tosses them both somewhere behind him. Rising back to his full height, Asa slides his palms up my bare sides. My stupid nipples pebble. Now that's more like it. He murmurs, backing us under the warm spray. I have to tilt my head back to hold his glowing yellow-eyed gaze. Droplets spatter my cheeks and catch in my lashes. We're flesh on flesh, his hard chest pressed to my naked breasts making my head spin. I knew the man was built, I'd have to be blind not to notice, but he is built. Like a bodybuilder. Who ate another bodybuilder? I hook my fingers in the soaked elastic at his hips. My turn? At his nod, I slowly peel his briefs down. His long thick cock springs free and I want to play it cool, but I can't stop my eyes from going wide. Dang. He's impressive. To say the least. A throaty sound rumbles through his chest. See something you like. I tear my gaze up to his face, my cheeks burning. His eyes dance with male pride. Arrogant bastard. I lift my chin. Don't flatter yourself. I've seen bigger. Lie lie lie. 
He barks out a laugh then circles my wrist, drawing my hand to curl around his hard length. Warm velvet over steel. We both suck in a breath as I stroke him. Think you can handle this little thing? His eyes burn into mine, voice smooth as honeyed whiskey. The perfect comeback dies on my lips as he spins me in his arms, pressing my back to his chest. One hand braces my hip as the other skims up my torso to my breast. A moan sneaks out from between my lips when he rolls a tight peek between his thumb and forefinger. I asked you a question, mate. His beard stubble scratches my shoulder as his lips find that sensitive spot below my ear again. Think you can handle me? A whimper escapes before I can stop it. My knees legit wobble. Marla, cool your jets. This is a tactic, a trick. Although, there's no reason I shouldn't get some satisfaction while I'm seducing my captor, is there? I swallow hard. Maybe? Why is my voice so small and breathy? His answering chuckle tickles my skin. He takes both my wrists in one big hand and lifts them up, pinning them to the shower wall. The movement presses my breasts out and arches my back. Oh fuck me, I whimper as his other hand slips lower to delve between my thighs and I melt under his touch. His little nibbles on my neck cause goosebumps. Don't you worry, I fully intend to fuck you. Repeatedly. Then his thick fingers part my folds and my brain totally short circuits. Any scrap of remaining wit flies out the window as this man plays my body like a well-tuned instrument. Within minutes I'm reduced to a slick panting mess, rocking my hips shamelessly to seek more friction. More I moan god yes more. That's it baby. Take what you need. His gravelly praise edges me higher as his clever fingers stroke and circle my throbbing clit. When his anaconda cock plunges inside me, my peak crests suddenly, pulsing through my core in crashing waves, tearing a ragged moan from my lips. My mind goes blank. My nerve endings sizzle like snap crackle pop cereal. I'm vaguely aware of Asa nuzzling my throat, and I tip my head back in silent offering. His lips brush the tender spot where my shoulder meets my neck in a feather-like caress before he bites and his teeth sink into my flesh. A breathy gasp escapes me at the sharp sting but endorphins flood my system, easing the discomfort until all I feel is sweet dizzying bliss. His release comes in a series of warm spurts and holy shit I see stars. Actual stars behind my clenched eyelids. As the last tremors subside, Asa gentles me through it with whispered praise. That's my girl. I'm as limp as cooked pasta in his arms. My brain cells are scrambling to reboot when he shifts us under the spray. Such a good girl. You took that so beautifully. He murmurs against my temple, cradling me to his chest. His tender tone surprises me out of my orgasm haze. I blink wet strands from my eyes and tip my face up to his. Asa, that was... I know. His lips capture mine softly. The kiss ignites a slow burn in my belly this time. Without the haze of lust, I can focus on the mind-numbing gentleness. The devastating tenderness. This big rugged wolf man is holding me like I'm made of spun glass, kissing me like I'm precious. Never in my life have I been precious. To anyone. I've never even felt valued or wanted, much less precious. And I'm so screwed. Because all this lavishing attention on me, it's working. My desperation to escape is fading under his patient seduction. His masterful hands and tender care are unraveling me thread by thread. This man is truly dangerous in a way I never anticipated. And he's nowhere near done with me yet. As if reading my thoughts, Asa maneuvers us out of the spray. He snags a towel, patting me dry with aching gentleness, his eyes watching my face. Reading me. Before I'm fully dry, he wraps me up and carries me back to bed. After laying me across the sheets, he stretches out his big body next to mine. Propped up on one elbow, he trails gentle fingers down my arm. Talk to me, mate. What's going on in that beautiful head of yours? His soft tone catches me off guard. I'm not used to anyone asking about my thoughts. Usually, I'm telling people whether they want to hear it or not. But Ace's patient gaze says he genuinely cares. I chew my lower lip, emotions warring inside me. I just didn't expect this for you to be so. So. He tilts his head, eyes searching mine. I look away, cheeks heating again. His knuckle traces my jaw tenderly. You thought I'd be uncaring? Selfish? At my tiny nod he exhales hard. Never. I've been praying to the moon for you my entire life. Emotion thickens his voice. When I meet his gaze again, his eyes glow and there's a fervent sincerity in their depths. My cynical heart opens just a crack. 
Ace's thumb strokes my cheek. I want to care for you, cherish you. His hand slides down to rest over my heart. You're my mate, my everything. Mate. That word I still don't fully understand. But the way he says it, with such reverence, makes my pulse quicken for an entirely new reason. I reach up to scratch an itch and find there's a huge open wound on my neck. And then I remember. He bit me. Chapter 7 With a shriek that nearly burst my eardrums, Marla leaps off the bed, clutching her towel around her and runs to the bathroom mirror. What the hell is this? She yells, gesturing wildly to the claiming mark on her neck. I adopt a soothing tone as I explain, it's a claiming mark. It lets other wolves know you're taken. That might have been a bad choice of words on my part because her expression morphs from angry to furious. Taken? No. No. It's not like that at all. I hold my hands up. Actually, it's exactly like that. Damn, I'm already messing this up. It's natural for wolf shifters to mark their mate as part of the bonding process. Mark their mate? Now she looks even more pissed, if that's possible. Like a brand? Are you saying you just branded me? Her hands are clenched into fists at her sides. I sigh, running a hand through my hair. When a wolf shifter meets their fated mate, the wolf inside recognizes that person as their other half. The claiming mark is a physical symbol of that bond. It doesn't mean you belong to me or anything. Even though she does. It just shows you're special to me. Lame explanation, but how exactly do you explain wolf mating bonds to a human? Clearly my fumbling attempt at an explanation does not go over well with Marla. Special to you? Like a toy you can tie up, lock up and use at your will, is that it? Now it's my turn to get angry. My inner wolf bristles at the accusation. It's not like that at all. I'd never treat you like a toy. Marla doesn't look convinced. She crosses her arms over her chest. Oh yeah? Then I guess if I'm so special to you, you won't mind if I just walk right out that door, will you? I shrug, trying to play it cool, even as my wolf whines inside at the thought of her wanting to leave. Go right ahead. This seems to startle her. I can walk right out of here. Like right out the door. I nod. The claiming mark means you're mine now. I don't have to keep you locked up here anymore now that you're wearing my mark. Everyone will know you belong with me. Marla's eyebrows shoot up. Belong with you? Listen to yourself. You seriously don't see anything wrong with what you just said? She throws her hands up in exasperation. Let me get this straight, I can leave right now if I want to. Yup, I say simply. She looks at me warily, like she thinks it's some kind of trick. Just like that? No fight? I chuckle. Mate, where exactly are you gonna go? We're surrounded by miles of wilderness. No roads lead in or out of Timbercrest Village. I smirk at her. So feel free to take your chances with Mother Nature if you really want to leave that badly. But let me know first so I can follow and fight off any wild animals who might want to eat you for a noonday snack. Marla opens her mouth like she's about to spit out an angry retort, then promptly closes it again. After a few moments of silently fuming, she finally speaks. Can I at least get some clothes? Or am I supposed to wander around in a bath towel? I chuckle. Progress. Sure thing. We can go down to the commissary today, and get you set up with a whole new wardrobe if you want. Marla looks slightly mollified at the prospect. Fine, but we have really got to talk about boundaries. She hisses through clenched teeth. Just then, her stomach lets out a loud growl that makes us both jump. She puts a hand over her belly, looking confused. Sounds like someone's hungry, I say with a grin. Perfect timing. I was just about to take you to the mess hall for an early dinner anyway. Now that you're... I'm about to say claimed, but think better of it. You can meet some of the pack. I toss her a t-shirt and a pair of sweatpants from my dresser. Marla ducks into the bathroom to dress as though I haven't already seen her naked. The shirt absolutely dwarfs her petite frame, and she's rolled the pants at the waist and ankles. I have to admit, it's pretty damn adorable. Her stomach continues to growl as I escort her through the cabin to the front door. I'm feeling pretty pleased with myself. It might take some time, but I feel confident I'll slowly win Marla over and our mating will work out very well. Of course, the universe just has to throw a monkey wrench into my optimistic outlook, because who do we find standing on my front porch the minute I open the door? Deke. And he does not look happy. 
His gaze lands on Marla and then goes to the claiming mark on her neck. His eyes widen, and his face morphs into a look of pure shock disbelief. What did you do? Deke roars. I move in front of Marla protectively. Not that Deke would hurt her in any way. It's an instinctual move. I can practically see the steam shooting from Alpha's ears. I shrug and say the only thing I can. She's mine. Chapter 8 I can't believe how beautiful Timbercrest Village is. It's like there's a filter over it that makes everything brighter and more vivid. Colors are richer, sounds are crisper and the air is filled with deep earthy scents I never noticed before. The world is more intense, like my senses have been dialed up a notch. I'm so entranced, I don't even mind Ace's arm around my waist possessively as we walk through what looks something like a rustic campground on our way to the mess hall. All the while my stomach keeps up a constant rumbling. I press a hand to my belly, willing it to shush but I'm famished like I haven't eaten in days. My hunger seems to unsettle Asa. His brow is furrowed and he picks up his pace. I'll get you food soon mate. I bristle a little at being called mate, but the promise of food curbs my snarky retort. I'm too hungry to waste energy bickering. As we enter a large log cabin, sweet and savory aromas waft through the air. My mouth waters and I wouldn't be surprised to find I'm drooling. Long picnic tables fill the space, crowded with people eating and chatting. The moment Asa leads me inside, all conversation stops as what feels like a hundred pairs of eyes turn our way. Many of the people staring also sniff the air, like they're trying to smell me. Rude. I shudder, uncomfortable with the sudden attention. Asa's hand at the small of my back acts as a steadying force as he guides me to an empty spot at one of the long tables. This is Ida. Asa gestures to an elderly woman seated on the bench. Ida, this is Marla. He beams as he introduces me. My mate. Ida looks surprised for a moment. Her eyes go to the bite Asa left on my neck. Then she too smiles widely. Why hello Marla. Welcome to Timbercrest Village. I smile and nod. My stomach rumbles loudly. Just sit here. I'll grab you a plate, Asa murmurs before hurrying toward what looks like a buffet line. Everyone's looking at me. The weight of the stairs pressing down on me makes me squirm. Ida must notice because she pats my hand affectionately. Don't pay them any mind, dear. They're just curious. We've never had an outsider here before. Once the novelty wears off, they'll stop gawking. Her warm voice puts me slightly more at ease and I'm glad Asa sat me beside her. I'm tempted to ply Ida with questions, everything from the structure of their society to this mate thing Asa keeps harping about, to the so-called claiming mark on my neck, you know. For my eventual best-selling memoir, but before we can chat further, a young man approaches tapping Ida on the shoulder and whispering something in her ear. Oddly, I hear every word. Someone's added too much oregano to the soup, and none of the kitchen staff know how to save it. Excuse me, dear, Ida says to me. I have a little matter to take care of. Ida rolls her eyes as she pushes herself up from the bench. No rest for the wicked. Have to keep on top of these youngsters every minute. Then she winks and follows the young man to the kitchen. I sit awkwardly alone, very aware that I'm the freak show attraction in this circus. As I silently will Asa to hurry up, several men approach my table. The tallest one takes the seat next to mine. Every man in the room is handsome, and this one's no exception with his brown hair dimples and laughing hazel eyes. Hi there, I'm Tavion. Don't think I've seen you around before, he says with an easy smile. His scent tickles my nose. It doesn't smell right. Nothing like Ace's cedar clove and musk scent. I offer an awkward little wave. Ah, uh, hi. I'm Marla. Marla. Beautiful name for a beautiful woman. He reaches for my hand and brings it to his lips for a lingering kiss while holding my gaze. Weird. Is he flirting or is this a wolf cultural thing? Of course, Asa chooses that moment to return, two overflowing plates in each hand and a murderous scowl contorting his handsome features. When his eyes land on Tavion holding my hand to his mouth, he slams the plates down hard enough to slop food over the edges. His menacing growl is so loud it echoes through the hall and silences the conversational chatter. Tavion stands slowly, not backing down. The two men seem to be locked in some macho standoff. The testosterone rolls off of them in waves, and the threat of violence is so thick in the air it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. 
looks like there's about to be a showdown. Chapter 9 Everything happens so fast. One minute Asa and Tavion are locked in an intense stare down. The next Asa's body ripples and he shifts into an enormous gray wolf. Before I can even process that, he leaps at Tavion with a ferocious snarl. Tavion responds by swiftly transforming into a chocolate brown wolf and meeting Asa's attack head on. The two wolves collide in a frenzy of snapping jaws and slashing claws. Tufts of fur fly as they tumble across the floor, viciously wrestling and biting at any exposed flesh they can reach. Gasps and shouts erupt around the mess hall. My heart pounds wildly in my chest as I watch the savage brawl unfold just feet away. This is no playful tussle. They're out for blood. Asa's savage growls mingle with Tavion's pained yelps. Every instinct screams at me to stop them but shock keeps me frozen in place. I've never seen anything so primal and vicious up close. I should try to break up the fight before one of them gets seriously injured or worse. I mean this is kind of my fault, right? Okay, not really, but it started because of me. I have to do something. Just as I take a step forward, Ida grasps my arm holding me back. Don't get between them, dear, she firmly cautions. Those are two powerful predators in the grip of fierce instinct. You'll only get yourself hurt. I hesitate, uncertainty and panic swirling in me as Ace's fangs snap millimeters from Tavion's throat. But the woman keeps a firm grip on my arm, her expression sympathetic yet adamant. Trust me. This needs to play out. Tavion openly challenged Ace's claim on you. He was way out of line, and Asa has to put him in his place. It's the way things are in our world. They won't seriously injure each other though, right? I still can't stand the thought of either of them getting maimed over some mild harmless flirtation that didn't mean anything. Ida smiles then shrugs indifferently. When she sees my horrified expression she adds, Don't worry. The Alpha will step in before it goes too far. Probably. She waves a hand in the air. Besides, a little bloodletting calms everyone down. I watch Asa pin Tavion and clamp his jaws around the back of his neck, shaking violently. Tavion whimpers, going still in submission. Then as Ida predicted, a commanding voice barks. Enough! Everyone in the crowd bows and exposes their neck, as a wave of dominance sweeps the room. Oddly enough, I expose my neck too. What the heck? Deke, the tall, broad-shouldered older man with the salt and pepper beard who Asa introduced me to as we left his cabin strides forward, radiating authority. Without hesitating, he grabs Asa by the scruff and pulls him off of a bloody tabion. He submitted. Stand down now. The order brooks no argument. Asa's sides heave but he doesn't struggle against the man's hold. Tavion's wolf slowly drags himself to his feet, head lowered submissively. As the man releases Asa with a warning look, the two wolves shift back into human form. It's startling to see their naked, scratched and bleeding bodies. Tavion's injuries definitely look worse, bite marks and gashes marring his skin. Yet he says nothing, just dips his head respectfully to the older man and hobbles away. Asa turns to me, anger fading into concern as his eyes rake over me. Are you okay, mate? I realize I'm shaking. I take a deep breath, trying to calm my rattled nerves. Ida gives my shoulder a comforting pat before tactfully slipping away. Yeah. I'm all right. My voice is somewhat wobbly. Just a lot to process. And you're naked. Asa steps closer, heedless of his nudity, and cups my cheek in one big hand as he looks down at me. His touch instantly soothes me. I'm sorry things got intense. The thought of another male touching you sends me into a rage. His jaw clenches, residual anger flashing in his eyes. You're mine to protect and care for. This sends a little thrill through me. No one has ever said such words to me, and no one has ever cared enough to fight for me. I have to admit, Ace's raw desire to protect me does something funny to my insides. So you're just going to fight any man who dares touch me, I tease. Ace's expression remains deadly serious. Yes. There he goes again with his blatant unapologetic possessiveness and unwavering conviction that I belong to him, which should piss me off on principle. Instead it makes heat curl deliciously in my core. And with his big naked body so close. Well, the rational feminist argument on the tip of my tongue sort of evaporates. Chapter 10 As we sit, I ignore my nudity since it's completely normal here in the shifter community. Marla notices though. 
Her eyes dart down and a blush creeps up her cheeks. I have to admit I'm pleased and flattered by her reaction. I'm even more pleased that after fighting Tavion for flirting with her, she seems to see me differently now. More accepting. Marla stares at the two overflowing plates and inhales deeply. She looks truly ravenous. Dig in, I say. She doesn't hesitate. She doesn't even bother with utensils, just grabs a thick, juicy steak with both hands and sinks her teeth in. I watch in fascination as she devours an amount of food I didn't think possible for a human. She notices my stare and pauses, embarrassment flashing across her features. Sorry, I'm just so hungry all of a sudden. And oh my god the taste. She can't hold back a moan of pure pleasure, and when a drop of bloody meat juice leaks from the side of her mouth and her tongue darts out and laps it up greedily, blood rushes to my cock. Don't apologize, I reply with a grin. I love watching you eat. In what seems like mere minutes her plate is clean and she's licking her fingers. So I head back to grab her a second helping. I eat my meal as well, but my eyes remain glued to my mate as she finishes her second and third helpings. She's spectacular. I feel our bond growing stronger by the minute. I hope she feels it too. When she finally pushes her plate away with a satisfied sigh, I stand and hold out my hand. Ready for a tour of the village? Marla takes my hand, a new lightness to her step as I lead her into the warm afternoon sun. She makes a point of not allowing her gaze to stray to my dick as I point out the various cabins and communal buildings throughout the village, explaining the purpose of each. Marla listens with keen interest and her eyes sparkle while she takes in our haven nestled among towering pines, a mountain oasis. I can't help but feel a mix of pride when she comments, This is like something out of a fairy tale. It's a sanctuary for our kind. And now for her as well. I don't say that because ever since dinner, her mean mugging has all but vanished and I don't want to trigger it again. She might be warming up to me. Maybe she's feeling the bond. We pause by a cluster of smaller cabins set apart from the others. This is the pup school, I explain. Where they learn until they're old enough to have jobs in the community. Marla peers inside the nearest one, a soft smile on her lips as she watches two wolf pups tussle playfully on a rug. This must have been a great place to grow up. Memories wash over me. It was. Like having a huge extended family. There was always someone around to play with or learn from. Sounds idyllic. Her voice is laced with awe. Sort of. Her brow raises. Sort of? I shrug. Well my parents died when I was just a pup. They were out hunting for the pack when there was a freak landslide, and several of our pack members were crushed. I swallow hard. After that Dekar Alpha kind of took me under his wing. He became like a second father to me. Understanding flashes in Marla's eyes. I'm sorry Asa. She slips her hand in mine giving it a squeeze. The simple touch means more than I can express. We continue walking in thoughtful silence for a while, until Marla says quietly, I know what that feels like. I grew up without parents too. My dad left before I was born and my mom well. She bites her lip. She was institutionalized when I was three. My Aunt Linda raised me but she never really wanted me around, and boy did she let me know it. Every day of my life, she made a point of telling me I was an inconvenience forced on her. I stop, turning to face Marla fully. The pain in her voice makes my heart ache. I'd like to maul Aunt Linda to ribbons right now. Wanna hear something funny? My mate gives me a sad half-smile. I used to dream about living in a place like this. Experiencing a sense of community and support. I never thought it actually existed. I tug her close. You're not alone anymore. Our eyes meet and in that moment I silently vow to do whatever it takes to make her happy here with me. I want to give her the home she's always longed for. I'll always take care of you, I promise. She gives a trembly laugh, blinking back tears, and I wonder if I could track down Aunt fucking Linda. It's okay. She shrugs. I survived. Learned to take care of myself. And my mother is doing very well since I had her moved to Silver Lake Residential Facility. Marla rests her head on my chest and we watch the sun dip below the trees, both lost in our own thoughts but comforted by each other's presence. Chapter 11 Curled next to Asa by the fire, I'm hit with a pang of guilt so sharp it makes me gasp. What am I doing, letting myself get seduced by Asa and this charming village? I was supposed to be the seducer, not the seducee. 
I can't believe I let myself forget, even for a moment, why I'm really here. I came to these mountains for a reason, to expose the existence of shifters for my mother's sake. She spent over 20 years locked up and written off as having paranoid delusions, all because she dared claim she saw a man turn into a wolf. She deserves justice, and I swore I'd be the one to get it for her. Yet here I am playing house with Asa, letting myself be distracted by his smoldering gaze and skilled hands. Enjoying the comforts of this quaint community, when I should be gathering evidence. Some daughter I am. Asa's phone rings and he swears under his breath as he takes the call in another room. Shame and anger well up inside me as I stare into the fire. I have to stay focused on my goal. When Asa returns his expression is grim. I have to go out for a little while. He doesn't look very happy about it. The Alpha needs me, but I'll be back as soon as I can. He strokes my hair apologetically before leaving me alone with my conflicted thoughts. With my goal renewed, I slip into Ace's bedroom and search for my cell phone. If he has internet access anywhere, I haven't found it yet. But if I can just get a signal, I may be able to send the video I captured of the shapeshifter. That, along with my eyewitness testimony, will present as hard, irrefutable evidence that shifters exist. After a short search, I finally find my phone in a drawer in the kitchen. Not a very good hiding place. It's almost like he wasn't trying to hide it at all. Luckily the phone still has enough charge to make a call, but my heart sinks when the display reads zero bars. I run around the cabin holding the phone in the air trying to get service but nothing. Not to be deterred, I sneak outside and head for higher ground. The farther I get from the village, the more the signal improves. By the time I reach a rocky outcropping, I have two full bars. Not great but it'll have to do. Handshaking, I pull up my editor's home number. After two rings, Jerry picks up. Marla, I was beginning to think you got eaten by one of your mountain wear bears or something. He snickers at his own joke, probably thinking he's hilarious. No, Jerry, but I've got the proof I promised you. I grin smugly as I wait, giving him time to digest that. Oh. I can hear the skepticism in his voice. Video footage? Of one of these shape-shifting man bears transforming. That's right. I'm sending it to you now. I attach the video file and hit send before I can overthink it. You should have it in a minute. Hot damn, Marla. If this is what you say, this could be the story of the year, the decade, possibly the century. Now he sounds excited. Finally. Send me everything you've got. I assure him I will before ending the call, my emotions riotous. I did it. Once the story breaks, I'll be able to get my mother released by proving she was right all along. News teams will be sent here to investigate. Hope and guilt clash within me. Asa and his pack will probably see this as the ultimate betrayal, why wouldn't they? But I have to do right by my mother. Once she's free, maybe I can try to make Asa understand. Wrapping my arms around my middle, I head back to the cabin not feeling nearly as elated as I should. Chapter 12 Deke's office has got to be my least favorite place to spend a Friday night. I was curled up by a cozy fire with my mate when I was once again summoned. I'm seated across from his desk tapping my foot as he stares at me sympathetically. His old man is here too, Councilman Grayson looking like he's just been sucking lemons. The councilman represents us wolves in Shifter Council, but only ever visits Timbercrest Village a few times a year. I'm guessing this little meeting won't involve celebratory beers and backslaps. Asa, Councilman Grayson begins steepling his fingers in front of his face. Do you have any idea why we called you here today? I resist the urge to roll my eyes. Of course I know why I'm here. This is about Marla, the woman who spun my world around like a Kansas twister. Not that I'm complaining. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me, no contest. But not everyone sees it that way, apparently. No idea, I say, giving my best innocent look. Deke's left eye twitches. Let me jog your memory then, Grayson says glowering. A certain human female has gone missing from Mystic Hollow. Tall red hair goes by the name of Marla Davis. Ring any bells? I shrug, slumping down a bit in my seat. Grayson gives me a withering look. Need I remind you that stealing another pack's female comes with severe consequences? Allegedly, I clarify. There's nothing alleged about it. Grayson snaps, smacking his palm on his son's desk loud enough to make me wince. You kidnapped her plain and simple. And now you're going to take her back. Right now. 
tonight, or face a reckoning from the council. Are we clear, boy? Crystal, I mutter. Inwardly, I'm snarling. There's no way in hell I'm letting Marla go, not after I claimed her as my mate. I'll fight Deke, Councilman Grayson, I'll fight the whole damn shifter council if I have to. She's mine. But I know when to pick my battles, so I keep my mouth shut and my expression neutral. Grayson studies me for a long moment, his bushy gray brows drawn down in a stern line. He's suspicious, and for good reason. I'm already plotting my escape plan. Finally he leans back with a weary sigh, steepling his fingers again. Son, I know you're still young. Still have those powerful hormones running rampant, and those strong mating urges. Deke lets out a groan and drops his forehead into his palm. So let me explain something, Grayson continues, tone gentling just a fraction. The Council is aware of the population crisis we're facing right now. We've been working to remedy it. Deke must not be aware of this because he straightens and his face perks with interest. Have you wondered why, when the Council frowns on inviting humans into our communities, there was a group of human females in Mystic Hollow? I had wondered that, but the question was overshadowed by the fact that one of them was my mate. It's because wolves aren't the only shifter species to suffer from lack of females. All shifters are in the same boat. And the Council has come up with a solution. Deke and I glance at one another, both surprised and intrigued. Grayson continues, Several possible solutions, in fact, to ensure the future of pack clans and pods. We've decided to try out a different remedy for each species. Despite myself, I'm overcome with curiosity, but Deke voices my question before I have a chance to. What kind of solutions are we talking about? Grayson settles back in his chair. For the wolves? A breeding program. We'll bring in human females to mate with our males. I stare at him blankly. Is he messing with me right now? Because this sounds like something out of a bad cosplay porno, not a serious solution to a serious problem. And you really think human women will volunteer for something like that? I ask skeptically. Grayson waves a dismissive hand at my question. Oh, they're already signing up. We've named it Breeders for Beast BFB for short. Has a nice ring to it, yes? He sits back with a cocky grin looking pleased with himself. I make a non-committal noise. Catchy? I guess in a creepy horror flick sort of way. I'm starting to wonder if Councilman Grayson is playing with a full deck. But Deke nods, arms crossed over his broad chest as he gazes at me with an unreadable expression. The first of the human females will be arriving in the next few days. My jaw drops. So this is actually happening? Where are you finding these human women? Grayson shrugs. They're volunteers, of course. Deke repeats my question. Where are you finding them? Grayson sighs, exasperated. Prisons. Brothels. Homeless shelters. They're women who are down on their luck and want a fresh start. We offer them a new beginning, and they birth us pups in return. I cringe, but he keeps right on talking. We have several currently going through the intake process, medical screening, psychological screening, that sort of thing. Then they'll be matched up with worthy males. He leans forward, elbows on his knees and stares pointedly at me. And now for the best part, Asa. You'll get first pick. All you have to do is return Ms. Davis to Mystic Hollow. It takes a second for his words to sink in. He wants me to dump Marla in exchange for one of these volunteer breeders. Just trade her in like it's no big deal to exchange one woman for another. The thought makes my blood boil. Not interested, I say through gritted teeth. Grayson shrugs. Suit yourself. But one way or another, that female is going back to Mystic Hollow. Tonight. Inside my wolf is snarling and snapping. But outwardly I just nod, keeping my face carefully blank. Yeah. Okay, sure. Not a problem. There. Let him think I'm placidly accepting his ultimatum. I'll figure out a way to keep Marla somehow. Hell, if I have to escape Timbercrest Village with her, go rogue and live in seclusion, I will. Grayson claps his hands together, beaming. Excellent. That wasn't so hard now, was it? He stands straightening his suit coat. Come on then, let's get this over with. We'll escort you home to collect her. The sooner we correct this little mishap, the sooner we can all move on. Fuck. He's calling my bluff. I stand reluctantly, shoving my hands in my pockets. Deke moves around the desk to join us, arms still crossed over his chest as he stares me down with an alpha's intensity. 
I dip my chin respectfully rather than challenge that stare. No point poking a bee's nest with a stick. Outside, I blink against the fading sunlight as we make our way across the common area. It's a crisp cool early autumn night. The scent of wood smoke lingers in the air from the nearby cabins. My cabin is on the far side of the clearing. Five minutes later as we approach my front door, my brain is scrambling for a plan, a way out of this. Maybe I can convince them I already took Marla away somewhere else. Or pretend she snuck off while I was gone. Somehow though, I don't think they'll fall for any lame half-baked excuses. With Deacon Grayson looming behind me, I step inside the cabin. The fire has died down in the hearth and the living room is empty. Marla? I call out praying she's gone for a long walk or something. Don't answer. Don't answer. Silence. Despite my relief, unease pricks my spine. Where is she? A cream-colored throw draped over the couch still holds a whisper of her sweet scent. But there's no other sign of her. I turn back to Deke with a bewildered shrug. Guess she's gone already. Too bad. Grayson makes a disappointed clucking sound. Asa, Asa. You're making this much more difficult than it needs to be. Sorry not sorry. It's then that I pick up the sound of the bathroom door opening, and Marla's footsteps padding down the hall toward us. Damn it. I pretend to go into a riotous coughing fit and nearly hack up a lung but it's no use. I know they hear her too. Asa? Marla calls from the doorway. There's something wrong with my eyes. My back is to her, so the first thing I see is the surprised expressions on Deacon Grayson's faces as their jaws fall open and their eyes widen. As I turn and take in the sight of my mate, my heart skips a beat. Her eyes, the rich brown irises, are now tinged with strands of amber and gold. And they're glowing. Like a wolf's eyes. Well I'll be damned. Deke breathes as my hope springs back to life. Grayson, knowing he's been beaten, shakes his head in defeat, but there's also a curious amusement in his voice when he says, Well now. This changes everything, doesn't it? Chapter 13 This is awkward. Here I am sipping tea with Asa, Deke, and Deke's intimidating father Grayson, who also happens to be some sort of bigwig on the shifter council, whatever that is. They're all staring at me like I'm an exotic zoo animal, while I try to maintain an air of casual politeness. Inside however, my thoughts ricochet around my head like a pinball. I can't stop thinking about that stupid video I sent to Jerry. Maybe I should have held off a little longer. At the time I thought it was the only way to redeem my mother's reputation and get her out of the institution, but now, after only what, an hour? I'm having second thoughts. Do I really want to be responsible for destroying this happy, peaceful community? I guess it's too late to ask that question now and I just feel terrible. I think of Ida, sweet, kind and welcoming. And the cute little pups wrestling in one of the schoolhouses while their classmates watched. They've done nothing wrong. They've hurt no one. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible person. A selfish, thoughtless person who is willing to sacrifice the lives of good, innocent people. The guilt is eating me alive. If only I could take it back. But it's too late. Jerry is probably giddy. I bet he's setting up interviews and booking spots on morning talk shows as we speak. These poor shifters' lives will be thrown into chaos because of me. I wiggle uncomfortably in my seat. Asa shoots me a look of concern, no doubt picking up on my distress. Yeah, no hiding my anxiety from his ever-attentive eyes. I attempt a weak smile to reassure him, and take a too big gulp of scalding tea, burning my tongue in the process. Deke jolts me from my spiraling thoughts when he and his father start peppering me with questions, trying to figure out how I could possibly have wolf shifter characteristics. Apparently my glowing eyes are a sign I have some wolf in me. The claiming bite must have brought forth and activated the latent traits. Councilman Grayson strokes his chin. It will be interesting to watch them as they develop. Latent traits? Wait. Are you saying? Does this mean I might, ah? Uh, I scan their faces. Shift into a wolf. Deke helps me out by finishing the thought. It's quite possible. What we're trying to figure out is how this could happen. To be honest, we've never seen it before. He looks questioningly at Grayson, who nods in agreement. Tell us about your parents. Grayson says. He seemed like a total pompous ass at first, but now his eyes are kind. I explain that I know next to nothing about my father, but tell him what little I do know, the measly scraps my mom told me, which may not be too reliable after all her years of being heavily medicated. 
His name was? What was it? Devin? Darius? Dayton? Yes, that's it. I remember my mom saying Dayton was tall and handsome and had a sexy smile. He also dumped her and disappeared before she could tell him she was pregnant with me. Deke and Grayson both look dumbfounded. Finally, Deke clears his throat. Are you sure? Of course she's sure. Asa says crossly, draping an arm over my shoulder supportively. I don't tell them about my mother and her supposed mental illness, but something dawns on me. Something that, as a journalist, I should have pieced together a long time ago. Everyone who knows about my mother's institutionalization knows why. Her adamant claim that she saw a man turn into a wolf. Not just once, but repeatedly. The one thing she never said. Never told anyone. Even me, was who this man was and how she knew him. But now as pieces fall into place it's clear. That man must have been my father. Oh God, was my father a wolf shifter? My pulse races, my palms grow clammy, and the back of my neck is sweaty. I need a break. I need to get away from the prying questions and intense stares for a minute. I'll be right back, I say making an excuse to duck into the bathroom. Holy shit. I might turn into a wolf. This is too much. I splash cold water on my face. And then I remember Jerry and the video. I have to do something, but what? Maybe I can convince him it's all a big practical joke. Whipping out my phone, I frantically check for a response from my editor. I open our text string and sag against the sink in relief when I see a red failed to send symbol next to the video. Thank the sweet baby Jesus for crappy cell service up here in the boonies. I breathe a huge sigh of relief, knowing I didn't just ruin a hundred lives with the push of a button. I'm not so clueless as to realize I've been given a reprieve here. A second chance. I won't blow it this time. I'll find another way to help my mom, one that doesn't throw Asa and the Timbercrest pack under the bus. They don't deserve that kind of betrayal. Returning to the living room, I perch nervously on the edge of the sofa. Deke and his father are staring at me strangely. Their expressions are, well it's weird but they're looking at me fondly, adoringly. I glance questioningly at Asa who just pulls me to his side protectively. Dayton was my son, Grayson says gravely and his eyes tear up with emotion. And my brother, Deke adds. He died many years ago in the same landslide that killed Asa's parents. We didn't know he fathered a child. My jaw drops. So my father was a wolf shifter. Not only that, but he came from this very village. Which would make you? Grayson continues with a watery smile. My granddaughter. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't process this. And my niece. Deke wears a wide grin. He winks. Call me Uncle Deke. After a moment of stunned silence, Deke's father clears his throat gruffly and says the sweetest words I've ever heard. Welcome home, Marla. Chapter 14 Where the heck is Asa? I woke up alone this morning, no sexy shifter in sight. Just an empty pillow where his handsome head should be. Needless to say, I was not thrilled. Now, hours later, I'm wandering around the village searching for my missing man. After the emotional roller coaster of yesterday, a tiny insecure part of me worries that maybe he's having second thoughts, about me, about us, about everything. I know it's ridiculous, but I can't shake the creeping anxiety that he skipped town to get away from me. Okay yes, I'm spiraling a little bit. Sue me. I scowl, kicking a pinecone as I meander between the clustered log cabins. Shifters call friendly greetings to me as I pass by. They all know I'm Ace's mate now. Many villagers make a point of introducing themselves and welcoming me to the pack. Some even compliment the claiming mark on my neck. I guess that's a thing here like showing off engagement rings. I smile graciously thank them and stop to chat. It takes hours to get to the mess hall and my stomach is growling louder than a freight train, but I'm touched by the warm welcome I'm receiving, even if the over-enthusiastic sniffing still weirds me out a little. The mouth-watering scent of some sort of venison stew hits me as soon as I enter the hall. Asa and I figured out last night that I must have such a ravenous appetite because of the wolf shifter DNA awakening from dormancy. According to Ida and Grayson, who asked me to call him Grandpa, my shifter characteristics are still emerging and I may even be able to shift one day soon. I grab a big bowl of stew and plop down at an empty table. As I shovel down the delicious meal, my thoughts inevitably turn back to Asa. I hate to admit how much his absence leaves me feeling adrift. 
insecure. Maybe the initial mating frenzy has worn off, and reality has sunk in. I wouldn't blame him, but the thought is painful. I know I rejected him initially, but this mate bond thing has taken hold of me with both hands and I'm completely attached to him. Does he regret choosing me as his mate? Suddenly my ravenous appetite is gone, and I push my half-eaten bowl away. Just as I'm sinking into a pit of despair, the mess hall doors open and my head snaps up, my heart instantly lifting at the familiar scent of my mate. He's wearing a wide grin as he makes his way toward me. One of his hands is behind his back and… Why is he walking so slowly? I stand up and run to him. Where the hell have you been? Hey babe. Miss me. Asa asks with a roguish grin. His strong arm wraps around me and I melt into him, my tension fading away. Maybe a little, I reply. Asa chuckles. Sorry I disappeared on you. I had an errand to run. His eyes twinkle mischievously. I brought you back a present. Before I can ask what he's talking about, the arm he's been holding behind his back emerges dragging something, someone with it. My jaw drops in astonishment. Mama? Her eyes are looking around wildly, one hand covering her mouth. Other than her obvious shock, she looks just the same as the last time I saw her. Her ash-brown hair is shoulder-length and she's clad in a flowy peasant blouse and long skirt. For a moment I just stare at her. It doesn't seem possible. But no, it's really her in the flesh. My mother. You, you're actually here, I finally managed to choke out, flinging my arms around her in a tight embrace. She feels solid. This isn't a dream. Is this all real? She whispers. It's real. After all this time, you finally have proof. Her face lights up triumphantly. I glance between Asa and my mother, bursting with questions. Not that I'm not thrilled to see you, Mama, but how are you here right now? I ask her incredulously. You have your boyfriend to thank for that. She beams at Asa. He showed up at Silver Lake in the middle of the night and broke me out. Just like that. He said we were going on an adventure, and what an adventure it's been. I haven't had so much fun in years. He even carried me on his back through rugged terrain for miles. She smiles affectionately at Asa. Then he brought me here to see you. Mama's eyes roam the room, taking everything in like she can't quite believe it. Asa presses a kiss to my temple. You told me the name of the mental hospital. You didn't honestly think I'd ask you to stay here without your mother nearby. My eyes fill with tears. Best. Present. Ever. Our heartwarming reunion is interrupted when the mess hall doors fly open so hard they slam against the wall, and Deke skids into the room. He freezes the second he sees my mother, and his eyes grow wide. He continues to stare so hard at my mother, I'm surprised his eyeballs don't leap out of his head, roll across the floor and attach themselves to her. What is up with that? My question is soon answered when Deke growls one word. Bait. Epilogue. The full moon bathes the forest in ethereal light, as Asa and I lope through the wood side by side. I relish the feel of the earth beneath my paws and the rush of cool night air through my fur. Ever since my first shift, I've fallen in love with my wolf form. The freedom of running wild, guided by pure instinct, is exhilarating. Asa nudges me playfully, and we race through the moon-dappled trees, nipping at each other's heels. My wolf is euphoric being near our mate like this. Eventually we stop by a secluded pond, both panting happily from the exertion. Asa nuzzles the side of my neck, inhaling my scent. A thrill goes through me at the primal intimacy of it. Our wolves communicate wordlessly, attuned to each other on a profound level through the mating bond. It only takes Asa a second to return to human form. For me, it's a little longer. Shifting is easier each time though, and it's only a couple minutes before my limbs have lengthened and reformed. We're both completely naked and when I look up, Asa pulls me against him, desire burning in his gaze. Asa, I gasp as he backs me against a tree, his strong hands roaming greedily. I need you, mate. He growls. I can feel it, the need radiating off him in waves, making me dizzy with yearning. As he claims my mouth in a fierce kiss, his tongue tangling with mine, he takes hold of my hips and lifts me up so I can wrap my legs around him. His hard length grinds into me, eliciting sparks of pleasure that make me shudder, and when he pulls back and looks into my eyes, my breath catches at the intensity of emotion in his gaze. Asa carries me to the edge of the pond, never breaking contact with me or letting go for a second. 
He sets me down gently on the soft grass before lowering himself over me. He makes love to me, our bodies moving together in perfect harmony, finding their own rhythm as we explore each other's pleasure spots. With every thrust and stroke of his body against mine, I find myself reaching higher levels of bliss until finally I'm overcome by wave after wave of ecstasy that leaves us both trembling from head to toe. Afterward I sprawl across Ace's broad chest deliciously spent as his fingers trail idly through my hair. Our skin is still slick with sweat. Asa wraps a proprietary arm around me and presses a kiss to my temple. My inner wolf preens at this display of possession under the moon. Asa, I've been thinking. I'm ready for that mating ceremony now. I keep my eyes fixed on my hand, nerves making my heart pound. Apparently, wolf shifters have ceremonies for everything, and Asa's been asking for us to have a mating ceremony for months, but I kept putting him off. He tenses. You're sure? He asks, tipping my chin up. What made you decide you're ready? I consider the question seriously. I guess I finally feel like I deserve it. Like I'm worthy. Ace's expression softens. He brushes his fingers over the claiming mark on my neck, the thing that already bonds us together. My old life seems hazy now, like a distant fuzzy memory. This vibrant shifter community and fierce, protective mate are my reality now. You've always deserved love and happiness, Marla. Sincerity rings in every word. My heart swells near to bursting with love for this man. I love you, mate. Asa nips my shoulder, a playful growl rumbling in his chest. And I intend to spend the rest of my life showing you just how much. Next book in the BFB series, Wolf's Jailbird.